Good evening to everybody. Uh, when Barry called me a few months ago and asked if I would participate, and he said that the topic was the first big love, I, I thought this was an HBO special that I'd have to worry about. And um, I was a little reluctant. He then began to explain that uh, this is a part of a new series and that in some ways the agenda is to support uh, the education fund, that is uh, the fund that helps to support teachers, uh, uh, particularly middle school, high school teachers, as well as students uh, at that level uh, in, in New York City. And that by itself was enough to get me here because that uh, right now is probably one of the greatest needs we have as a society. If any of you who heard the President's State of the Union uh, speech got a very clear message about how we have to shift from not only honoring the kid who wins the uh, football game, but also the kid who wins the science fair, and the, and the difficulty in trying to make that cultural shift. And so in any way that we can uh, do that, uh, Barry, I think we need to put our shoulder to the wheel to, to begin to very much change the, the value system, particularly for children at that level. Uh, the other thing that absolutely compelled me to come was when he told me that Myron Hofer was also going to be um, participating. And I thought, I would come just to hear Myron. I, I hope I don't have to speak. But he said that I, that is the price, that I have to say something about uh, my own work. And so I will do that. Um, rather quickly, I'd like to tell just a couple of stories that really begin to get at the issue of, 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 sort of the neurochemistry or the uh, biology that is involved in social bonds. And, for those of you who were hoping for a full explication of the battle hymn of the tiger mother, uh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, maybe we'll do that in discussion time, but um, it's not something that uh, I can um, say that I have really begun to understand. So I'm going to talk about uh, actually a hormone called oxytocin, which Barry mentioned very briefly. Uh, and it has often been called the maternal hormone because um, it is involved in um, labor. It actually is the hormone that is secreted by the brain to cause the uterine to, uterus to contract uh, at the onset of labor. It's also critical for lactation. So uh, it causes the mammary muscles, the mammary myometrium to contract to allow for milk ejection. So it's the milk ejection reflex. And what we often think about in neurobiology over the last three decades or so is the conservation of function. But often, uh, hormones or peptides or uh, chemicals that have a, a particular effect on peripheral organs do something highly relevant to that in the brain. And so a natural question here was, does the same agent, which is made in the brain and has receptors in the brain, does the system in the brain support the motivation and the behavior associated with maternal care? maternal love, maternal, we don't use the term love so much in science, we call it attachment. Hey, it's probably the same thing, except it is something that you could study in many other species, even when there isn't uh, the subjective experience that you can share. So that question of whether this hormone might be important for maternal attachment goes back quite a ways. It's probably about a 30-year-old question, and it was studied initially in rats by um, people who were just trying to find out what changes at the time of parturition, at the time of birth, when a typical female rat goes from being actually afraid of offspring, afraid of pups, to suddenly running around building a nest and putting the pups in them, and she will defend them at the cost of her own life. And that transition takes about two hours. It's a remarkable change in personality where the female will go from running away, if you put a pup in the cage, to running towards it and doing everything she can to take care of it. And it turns out that that change is associated with this profound increase in oxytocin, not only in the blood where you need it for labor and delivery and lactation, but also in the brain. But maybe more to the point is experimentally, again in rats, if you take that female who was so avoidant and was going to the other side of the room or other side of the cage when you put pups near her, uh, and you give her oxytocin into the brain in the right way, uh, she will suddenly scurry around, build a nest, uh, 
retrieve pups and put them in it, even though 10 minutes earlier, that would have been the most unlikely outcome. So the peptide in some way, in a female who's been induced in the right way, can actually stimulate maternal behavior in a very, very powerful way, something that one wouldn't see otherwise. Maybe even more powerful or more compelling as evidence were studies done here at Rockefeller in the early 1980s by Don Pfaff and his colleagues that showed that not only would this hormone put into the brain induce maternal behavior, but if you allowed a, a female to go through labor and to deliver pups, but you gave her a blocker, either a chemical antagonist or an antibody, or you did something that pre prevented oxytocin from being able to be secreted directly into the brain, though it could go into the rest of the body, the female would lactate, but she would not build a nest, and she wouldn't pull pups into the nest, and she wouldn't show anything that looked like normal maternal care. So all of those observations together suggested that maybe oxytocin was both necessary and sufficient for, in, in the case of rats, for this maternal behavior. Is it necessary or sufficient for, for female humans to have maternal behavior? Probably not. Because unlike rats, we don't tend to be so avoidant of offspring. We are, if Freud were going to look at this, he would say that we are, promis we are polymorphously parental. We, we tend to do parental behavior in a much more uh, implicit way. Uh, and there are many species like that. Uh, it just turns out that rats are not one of them. So for rats, oxytocin seems to be essential for that transition from being non-maternal to maternal. But nonetheless, there's the possibility that this hormone, which does go up enormously for labor and lactation in humans, also has an important role. I'd like to suggest to you that actually there's another question that this all introduces, and that is, if this peptide is so important for maternal bonding to an infant, is it possible that it's also important for the bonding that takes place between males and females, not a maternal uh, infant at the, that particular point in time, but uh, in adolescence there, or thereafter. So you could call this mate selection, you could call this uh, sexual selection, you could call this uh, pair bonding. There's an interesting history to these kinds of questions. In some ways, this goes back um, more than a century to um, psychoanalysts who thought a lot about how does that first experience change all subsequent social experiences and there again, there has been um, some s deep scientific work on this question to ask, is there any evidence that, that, that males will change, will select a girl who looks just like the girl who married dear old dad? Uh, is there any way that we could actually investigate that? And it was first done, oddly, now uh, 25 years ago uh, uh, in a paper that was published on Valentine's Day in Science that showed that if you, in this case, raised rats, uh, and at the moment they were born, you painted the, the dam, the mom's nipples, with lemon-flavored uh, lemon scent, uh, that the males would grow up to select females who were lemon-scented. Um, a little bit like that song. The odd thing here is that it didn't have an effect on females, uh, and we can all try to think about why that might be. Um, this seemed to be entirely driven by uh, learning the odor in a very primary way, and that that uh, odor cue was what drove mate selection uh, later in life. Uh, it turns out that a similar kind of experiment has been done more recently um, in sheep, and in this case, it was in an even more profound kind of observation, uh, right after birth, there was a cross-fostering, so uh, the male uh, lamb was put, in the case of sheep, was put with a, uh, what's called a nanny, a, a goat mother, and goat offspring, males, were put with a ewe, with a sheep mother. And then the animals were raised, they were actually given lots of experience with their own species, in terms of social experience all the way through development, but the actual nursing was done on the, uh, on the other species, and then when they grew up, the question was, who would they select for uh, uh, to, to bond with. 
And that's a great thing to do because uh, sheep are actually a very, very selective. In, the, in this case, it's not an olfactory selection, it's a visual one. And sure enough, for males, they would choose, they actually preferred, if they had been raised by a nanny, they preferred to mate with a goat. And if they had been raised by a ewe, they preferred to mate with a sheep. So Freud had a point. Uh, there's something to this idea, at least for males, that this early experience in some way shapes subsequent mate selection and partner preferences. What's the driver? Well, one possibility is that these, these peptides, such as oxytocin, are really critical for that. And the reason we think about this is because in the same way that I said that there's sort of a conservation of function, that's something that might be important in the periphery, has a related function in the brain, it turns out that there's very much a conservation of function across evolution, and that peptides that had one particular role in, um, in early vertebrates usually retain that in one form or another. Oxytocin is a, is a peptide, it's a nine amino acid small molecule, and it has a very ancient history in that as you look across all vertebrates and even into invertebrates, it seems to have a role in being ex found mostly in neural tissue and gonadal tissue. And it's particularly important for social behavior, especially reproductive behavior, but not only reproductive behavior. So in the case of birds, the representative peptide that looks like oxytocin, in that case it's called mesotocin, is important for flocking. Or, uh, so if you block it, birds form smaller flocks, you add it, or birds form larger flocks. There's a related peptide called vasopressin, which is found uh, in a very similar kind of ancestral lineage. And in this case, it seems to have similar effects on behavior, but mostly are pl those behaviors are played out in males. Important for territorial behavior, and sometimes for aggressive behavior, sometimes for mate selection and reproductive behavior in males. But both oxytocin and vasopressin are released in a very profound way with reproductive behaviors themselves. So sex is actually a huge stimulus for the release of, of both hormones. The question that we wanted to begin to explore when we thought about this was whether there's a way to actually test out whether oxytocin or vasopressin would be critical. In the same way I talked about maternal behavior and the importance because it was both necessary and, and sufficient, could you, do the, could you show a similar effect for pair bonding, for uh, forming long-term um, partner preferences? And to do that, we had to, form, we had to find a, a, an animal that actually formed partner preferences. Most rats, mice, and other laboratory animals don't. Uh, but there are some that do. Uh, they're not found in laboratories, but they're found in the field. And these were found actually in the Midwest, in parts of Illinois and uh, parts of Kansas. Uh, prairie vole, which is it's not a mole, it's a vole with a V. Someone once pointed out to me that this is an anagram for love, but I'm not going to go that direction particularly. <laughs> and what's important about understanding them is that they live in social groups they are monogamous in the sense that they, both male and female, have an important role for taking care of the young. Um, they bond for life. If you take out the male or the female from the mated pair, they will not accept a new mate 90% uh, of the time. And uh, the pups show a very high level of affiliation and great distress when they're separated. What makes them so appealing to us, besides the fact that this is just such a wonderful story and who wouldn't like monogamy, is that there are other species that are in the same genus, so they're called montane voles. In this case, these are trapped for us in, uh, in southern Idaho in about the four or 5,000 foot range in, in the Rocky Mountains. And there they live in solitary burrows. They're truly asocial. They um, have very little parental care. The male has none and the female has minimal parental care. She lactates and she takes care of the young and then she abandons them about 14 days. They don't form bonds after they mate. So rather than being monogamous, we call them promiscuous. And they, even the pups, show very low levels of separation distress. So what a wonderful opportunity to say, what is different about these two species? Because if we could understand that, we might be able to understand the evolution of monogamy and the evolution of pair bonding and the evolution of attachment, at least in adults. And so we began those studies many, many years ago, and I'm just gonna tell you the story very quickly because there's, uh, it's, there's so many sides to it, but I'll sort of hit the highlights for you.
Now, the way to study it is you ask these animals to spend a little time together. Maybe they mate, maybe they don't. In this experiment, they're allowed to mate. And then you ask the male, do you want to be with your partner that you've mated with or with a stranger? And you can see that prairie voles, the ones that are monogamous, will almost true to form, choose to be with their mate. And that uh, montane voles, they're the solitary animals, spend most of the time alone, and don't show any preference, just as they don't in the field with the uh, uh, individual they've mated with. And that's true for both males and females. That is just um, very much uh, hardwired for the, for the species. So here's the question. Does this oxytocin or vasopressin have anything to do with this experience? I told you that they're both released in a very profound way with mating. Uh, they're both important for attachment in, with pups. What about in this, for these adult attachments? And so we did, when I say we, it was really this gentleman, uh, Jim Winslow, and I have his photograph here because he just recently died of cancer about six weeks ago, and it's somebody who has worked with me for uh, 30 years. And so this is a really a huge loss, not just to me personally and to the laboratory, but to the field, because he's done such important work over these many years. <clears throat> what Jim showed, excuse me, was that if the animals didn't have a chance to mate, and they were given either vasopressin or oxytocin, that with vasopressin alone, <clears throat> they would form a pair bond. CSF means cerebrospinal fluid. That's just the vehicle that these peptides were given in, and that was used as a control. And the oxytocin, which we thought was going to be the, the really important agent for getting these animals to show a preference, didn't seem to have any effect whatsoever because they spend equal amount of time with the partner and the non-partner. So this was a little bit of a surprise to us, but what was perhaps most exciting was that, in fact, one of these hormones, vasopressin, the one that does work in males, uh, seemed to work here, and in this case, we were, in fact, studying the males. When we began studying females, it was just the opposite. It was the oxytocin that gave us precisely the same results. Now, <clears throat> we were pretty interested in this, but we were forced, of course, to ask the more pressing question, which was, because this suggests that the release of the hormone is sufficient, but is it necessary? And the way to do those experiments are actually to turn this around and allow the animals to mate but in this case, give a blocker. So you could give a vasopressin antagonist or an oxytocin antagonist. And when you do that, you see that the, the vehicle, the placebo treatment has no effect. All the animals mate. They all form a very powerful partner preference. The oxytocin blocker has no effect. They still form the partner preference when you block oxytocin. But the vasopressin blocker, they mate perfectly normally, but they do not get attached. And that was uh, really, a, for us, a very powerful observation. The same kind of finding was found for oxytocin in studying females. This is a story about the prairie voles, this species that forms these bonds. And of course, what we were trying to understand is the other species as well, the one that's solitary. And so we did the same experiments. We said. Maybe if we gave oxytocin or vasopressin to this non-monogamous species, we could get them to form these long-term attachments. And we couldn't. In fact, we could give them the peptides in the same way, but instead of forming attachments and increasing their social behavior, we increased their scratching and grooming behavior. They did a lot of self-scratching. And they showed lots of behavioral responses, but none of those responses were social. We didn't understand that for a long time, and we argued about what might have been involved uh, that would lead these two species that were so closely related to have such different social organizations and such completely different responses to oxytocin or vasopressin. And the answer uh, was an answer that we probably should have figured out long before we did, but we did it at a time when we were studying anatomy of the brains, and we, what we figured out was that the two species had very different maps very different distributions of receptors for these hormones. They both made the hormones, same hormones, had about the same amount, but the receptors that are really important for getting that hormone release signal were in completely different brain areas. And in the case of the prairie vole, the species that forms these pair bonds, the receptors were in parts of the brain, for like this one called the nucleus accumbens, that were really important 
for, pair, for reward and pair bonding, we learned later on. The same was true for vasopressin receptors. In the case of the montane vole, they have plenty of receptors, but not in the reward circuitry. It's actually in other parts of the brain that are important for territoriality and, and other kinds of functions. This is really surprising because it tells you, I love it when I come to give a talk and there's a baby in the room and we're talking about parental behavior, that's great. Um, so it tells you that uh, what we're dealing with is that the peptides are having different behavioral effects because they're completely different targets. It's just like the difference between having an effect on the heart and having an effect on the liver. These are completely different circuits that are getting turned on when these animals mate and release these hormones. And in the monogamous species, you're turning on a circuit that's important for reinforcement, reward, learning. It's like an addiction for them. Now this forced us into asking some really difficult questions and we had to go from kind of the anatomic level to the molecular level because we wanted to know why would this be so different? Why would these two closely related species end up with completely different patterns of receptor expression? And there's an answer. And the answer is actually very simple, but it was, again, one that we didn't understand for a long time. The genes for these receptors are identical up until an area that just in front of the coding sequence, every gene is made up of coding sequence, and the area that flank it. And it's those flanking areas that tell the gene when to turn on and when to turn off. And there, the, the monogamous voles down here, not just the prairie vole, but there are many other species of monogamous voles that we studied, were, they had a, a, not a mutation, but they had an insert. They had about a 400, 500 base clump of DNA that landed in that area. And there was every reason to think that that might really alter the pattern of expression. And we've done lots of experiments, again, we being they, uh, people in the laboratory. In science, we use what's called the royal we. So if I say I, I mean we. If I say we, I mean they. And if I say they, I probably don't mean anybody at all at that point. So this is a, uh, was to us the kind of lead in to trying to really understand the evolution of monogamy because it turned out that we could then look at many other species and try to understand how the, the rules were written for, the, the, for driving this pattern of expression. So just to tell you the story in summary then, the localization of these receptors is very different in the two species, the one that's monogamous and the one that's not. And the differences seem to be due to these flanking sequences for these different receptors. The, res the, the location is everything here. It's like real estate. Location, location, location tells you how the brain works. It's all circuit driven. And if you label different circuits, you get different behaviors out. In species that have mating-induced pair bonds that form these long-term attachments, these receptors are found in areas, in circuits that are important for reward. And we know from the pharmacological studies that those hormones are by themselves necessary and sufficient for uh, developing these long-term attachments. So at least in this species, we had a pretty good idea about a biological basis for attachment between adults, we knew from the rat that these were important for attachment between mother and infant. What about humans? Well, there's been a huge amount of work on this in the last five years, suggesting that oxytocin, which has to be given intranasally, you actually snort it because if you inject it, uh, only about 2% or 1% gets into the brain. But if you snort it, a uh, larger percentage gets into the brain, although we don't know exactly how much. And many people have done these experiments, in this case with healthy volunteers, showing, as you can see here, an increase in trust, increase in empathy, decrease in stress reactivity, the effects on something called parochial altruism in intergroup conflict, which I must confess I still don't understand, having read this paper many, many times. It's become clear that there is variation in humans, just as there is variation in voles. And it's driven by genetic variation in the um, receptor genes. Uh, and this paper that's coming out actually just in the last few months suggests that actually the variation in receptors has to do with, again, reward dependence and how different people respond to reward signals. And not only does it change their behavior, but it also has to do with differences in brain circuitry. So those people with what's called the 
high-risk version of this gene, this is a common variant on the oxytocin receptor gene, actually have a different pattern of connections between the hypothalamus and the amygdala, which is shown here, and it's thought to be the, the pattern or the part of the mechanism by which reward dependence differences can be explained. It has also led to lots of interest in studying autism and the possibility that autism, which might have a very strong genetic component, could in some way be related to the genes for these receptors, since the receptors seem to be so important biologically for attachment and social motivation and social interest. And we and many others have looked over the years to find out whether any of these variations are associated with autism. Many of them are, including a whole series in the oxytocin receptor on chromosome 3. And then most recently, and perhaps most uh, uh, exciting for us is the possibility that oxytocin, which increases social behavior in so many species, could also be used to increase social interest in children with autism. And this is, again, a paper just out in the last few months that uh, uses a computer game to look at how children with autism engage in social behavior. It has them snorting oxytocin. I don't know how well you can see this, but what the, the point of the paper is that when they take oxytocin but not the placebo, um, um, administration, there's a very significant increase in their engagement in this social computer game that they have a chance to play. And there's also a slight increase, but not that profound, in, in the amount of eye contact and social interaction that you see. So just to, again, summarize what is a very exciting literature, and again, like with the animal work, a lot of this work is going on here as well. The oxytocin receptor allele, that means the variation in the, in the sequence of this gene is associated with differences in the uh, connections between the amygdala and the uh, hippocampus and the hypothalamus and differences in social cognition that are really quite strong. There are thoughts that maybe there'd be the same differences in receptor localization, but we actually don't know that yet. And there's still a great need. Anybody who is a graduate student, I recommend this is a wonderful paper that or a wonderful project someone needs to take on is to actually localize the receptors in the human brain and to look at variation in different populations. There is some evidence that the vasopressin receptor can be quite different. And finally, <clears throat> this evidence that we have from these studies that both oxytocin and vasopressin, just as they do in animal studies, increase trust and empathy and social interaction. And there's the possibility that these could in fact be useful as medications if we could create small molecules that would have similar effects. So that's a very quick rundown of two very um, interesting stories. We could perhaps talk more about them in the time for discussion. I wanted to just uh, summarize by saying that the one that has the animals in it here basically is telling us that these receptors are really the link for social signals that bring together social signals for um, saying, I know you're social, to something that says, I know I like you. And so they bring together social signals with pathways for motivation and reward. And the best information that we have is that oxytocin and vasopressin may be important as a, um, for increasing social interaction in humans, but we still don't know very much about the mechanisms of that, and we don't know exactly what the applications will be. I'd like to end with a quote that uh, comes from one of my mentors, uh, Paul McLean, which I think has been the one lesson that I've taken from so much of this work, and that is that some of the best experiments are those that nature has done for us. The idea being that although we tend to think about science as going into laboratories and creating something out of whole cloth and trying to come up with designs of experiments that make sense, in fact, evolution is the great tinkerer. And there are just an enormous number of experiments in the natural world that we haven't begun to truly understand. And so by looking at these kinds of species differences, uh, for instance, with the voles, by trying to understand the molecular and cellular basis for how those species differences come, across, uh, come about, we have great clues that we can begin to follow for understanding much, much more uh, about human social behavior as well. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be on the same program with Tom. He's an old friend, and uh, I guess we're bonded in some way. Um, 
And so it feels good, but it's also, I enjoy talking to groups of parents because um, like the experiments in nature that Tom just talked about, uh, parents are arguably experiments in nature and they have very good questions. And scientists don't, it's very important, we know in science, to have the right question. And a lot of times the question is just sort of one more um, filigree on something that's already known, and that's a sort of safe sort of question. But parents ask questions that really make you think. And you'll see some examples of that when we have trouble answering your questions after this. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And I chose this title and the good enough mother um, quote there from Donald Winnicott uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, that it, I think, came at an important time when um, the psychoanal between the psychoanalysts and John uh, Bowlby and Harry Harlow and his monkeys, it was becoming very clear that early mothering really mattered. And of course, uh, mothers became anxious about that and uh, depressed sometimes. And Winnicott was a pediatrician before he became an analyst. And he has a view and a concept of uh, mother-infant interaction that I think is very sane and has been very helpful. But um, secondly, um, I think the biology, and I'll try to uh, show you this a little bit, really backs up this idea of a good enough mother, and I'll try to illustrate that. Um, Winnicott seems very wise in, in retrospect, uh, and here he was uh, with this concept in 1953, but if we go back to 1943 and the Blitz, uh, where large numbers of children, uh, of parents who had to work and stay in London during the Blitz, were evacuated to countries' uh, homes where uh, they were very much welcomed, but to the astonishment of even sophisticated people like Anna Freud, uh, the children were not relieved at all. <clears throat> in fact, they were much more upset by being evacuated uh, to the country with nice parents than they were with the bombs falling all around and they're having to go into uh, shelters. And that suggested a couple of things. Uh, and particularly, it drew everybody's attention to maternal separation as a much more powerful uh, and important event than had been thought before that. Um, and certainly the British attitudes towards mother-infant interaction that Bowlby talks about and that he experienced as a child where he was introduced to his parents by his nanny at tea time uh, was a very different view of the parent interaction that we are dealing with now. Uh, so this opened everybody's eyes uh, to something important. Oops. And uh, then Harry Harlow, uh, published in 1958, but was probably doing these experiments at the time that Winnicott uh, came up with this uh, wonderful concept. And you're probably all aware of the terry cloth mother and his finding that monkeys liked uh, objects like this more than a wire or a wooden surrogate that gave them milk. And that pretty much destroyed what was known as the kitchen cupboard theory of early object relations, which was uh, actually Freud's, that the reason that the infant loves its mother is because the mother gratifies it primarily with nutrient. And it suggested there were other things going on. But it was, for me, uh, the experiments that uh, Len Rosenblum and Charles Kaufman did on separation of monkey infants after the relationship had been established uh, that uh, they sort of galvanized <clears throat> my attention. Uh, and I think just looking at that makes you realize that there must be something very, very fundamentally biological in this, as well as, well as it being uh, emotionally quite gripping. So Bowlby's um, idea is what we call paradigm was that a bond was, was formed uh, 
uh, which was an emotional tie between the mother and the infant. And when this was um, ruptured or uh, broken, it initiated an organized um, psychophysiological response with a protest phase of calling and searching and a despair phase that you saw the picture of. And he put this in an, in an, um, in an evolutionary frame that uh, the first phase was useful for uh, bringing the mother back and the second uh, preparing for a long absence and conserving energy and avoiding attracting predators. And it made an awful lot of sense. And uh, I think it's with us today, and it still, I think, applies at the psychological level, but at a deeper biological level, there are other things going on in addition. And the questions that this uh, theory uh, aroused in, in I think in my mind, in the mind of a number of other people who work in this area. Um, <clears throat> the first, Tom has given you an elegant uh, example of how you ask the question and how you begin to understand how the infant recognizes and prefers its own mother and becomes uh, attached to it so that it wants to stay close. Or behaviorally, you observe that it always does stay close and you try to get it away, it goes back. Um, then there's the question of separation and how does an early separation exert its effect? If you're a biologist and a kind of cynic, you say, look, separation is a non-event. We don't see major responses to things that just are something stopping. And there must be something else going on. And sure, you can explain it uh, as an emotional response, but it certainly suggests and the severity of the response and the intensity of it suggests that there may be other kinds of biological processes that could um, explain it. Uh, and the long-term effects that um, were thought to take place as attachment theory um, grew and the different kinds of early attachment seem to be related to long-term effects. How on earth did these early relationships shape later development and the most long-term effect, how were intergenerational effects transmitted? Because it did seem as if that was true. And at the psychological level, we have an understanding of how an in, what's called an internal object representation is. That in our minds, we have a, a set of, um, of uh, organized mental activity that um, in memory uh, is in our psychological mind and can influences our behavior and it's based on our own memories of what went on in, when we were children. Could there be more, a biological layer underneath this psychological layer that we uh, understand a lot better? And I started uh, to work with rats thinking actually at that time that we would not be able to study maternal separation in an organism that didn't have these complex emotional, psychological uh, uh, competencies. Uh, a colleague of mine asked me, how would the infant that rat even know that his mother wasn't there? Now, that's not a good question, actually. <laughs> um, but don't be fooled by that picture. Uh, this is not a sign of affection between the two. In fact, it's, uh, it's a very practical bit of social learning. The young rat learns what foods are safe by smelling the mother's breath when it comes back from foraging as a, a absolute uh, central importance, just like bonding, it's absolutely essential. Uh, but this isn't it, and you can't judge by uh, superficial areas. But instead of seeing that nice, um, simple graph that I showed you just a minute ago, what we saw in the infant rats, to our great surprise, was what you might uh, even call an explosion of changes in, in almost every system that we looked at. Uh, the few that don't show it are uh, here, but in many different systems. And you can still see the protest phase with the calling and the uh, activity, and you can see the despair phase with the fall in heart rate and, and metabolism and the, a great lethargy and behavior and uh, so on. They look uh, 
as if they really were in a conservation state. But on the other hand, here were increased arousals during sleep, uh, increased sucking, uh, that was known as a, as a result of separation, but wasn't talked about much by Bowlby. And their behavioral reactivity was uh, greatly increased when they were warm. And their corticosterone uh, underwent a major change, uh, as Gig Levine and his group showed, uh, using our same approach, uh, where it all through this period in infancy, corticosterone is kept at very low levels and doesn't rise very much on stimulation. Removing the mother changes that completely, so that now they're high at resting levels and even more responsivity. And uh, we found, and he found too, and so did Saul Stanberg, uh, Shanberg in investigating the fall in growth hormone, that individual aspects of the interaction between the pup and the mother were uh, responsible, their removal or loss, were responsible for these changes so that you could prevent them by uh, supplying one or another aspect of the, of the interaction. Uh, for instance, uh, it, it, the growth hormone fall, Saul Shanberg found, could be prevented by vigorous tactile stimulation. And, uh, we found that the um, heart rate response, this tremendous half, 50% drop in heart rate, uh, and the turning off of thermogenesis could be uh, reversed by putting food in the stomach. It didn't have to do with absorption of nutrient. It had to do with gastric interreceptors, which was a system and a set of responses that we still don't understand very well, actually. But it was a whole new mechanism and very interesting. And the corticosterone response here had uh, what we call, became to call regulators working at two different levels. Nu the, the availability of a nutrient worked at the level of the adrenal to cause this increase and could be, uh, if nutrient was provided, uh, part of the response would be uh, prevented. But if tactile stimulation was given, and it didn't require very much, not as much as it did to uh, prevent the growth hormone response, then the um, separated infant would look normal. So what you have here is a, uh, a set of uh, responses to loss. So it's interesting that now with a different, slightly different word than separation, you, the metaphor works better here. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe most important, uh, we found that if you prevented this, this part of the response uh, by putting an anesthetized mother there, all the rest of these changes occurred, um, continued to occur. So it was not an integrated psychophysiological response. So this is the kind of um, finding that really makes you think and it makes science a lot of fun. To try to unpack and study a really new way of thinking about separation. Uh, and now, uh, it's not that it had, un, it's saying there's nothing, no bond here. You need the bond in order to have the interactions. Um, and the interactions that are here are regulatory on a number of different systems, as I described. Uh, and it starts to suggest, uh, it started to suggest to us that since these interactions continue over early development, could they possibly be having some long-term effects? Could they even be regulators of development? Could they affect development if there were different patterns? And if you look at the various different uh, regulators that, that we found, they involved all uh, sorts of systems. And um, as it got a little more sophisticated here, it began to shade into something that we might see in humans. For instance, uh, in order to reverse the sleep-wake state uh, changes, uh, the tactile stimulation had to be uh, intermittent. If it was constant, it had no effect. And it had to be intermittent along the schedule of nursing bouts, as if the Tactile stimulation was a, an entraining stimulus for biological uh, rhythms, setting them, giving them a focal point to keep them hanging together. 
And then we can uh, speculate that uh, these kinds of things in humans shade off into the very much more complex interactions uh, that we see between human parents and infants. Now the infants not simply being affected, they play a very important role here um, in this whole thing, so that it's a dual regulatory system. The infant's sucking is essential for the lactation, as we know is also true in humans, and their activity level affects the mother's appetite, and their suckling uh, is uh, necessary, uh, and their activity level for uh, getting the mother into a sleep state in which she can inject milk. So that this is a, really a dual homeostatic system uh, that's at work. And it expands our idea of mother-infant interaction at the biological, so deeply into the biological level. And it's interesting how that um, uh, diagram looks somewhat similar to this, which comes from a recent uh, papers by Beatrice Beebe. Um, who is studying in microanalysis human mother-infant interaction, where the, um, the interactions, each interaction between the mother and the infant um, actually serves to regulate their affect state and regulates their, uh, their behavior for the next interaction. And it seems as if this kind of uh, interaction and its subtle variations are very important for forming the kind of complex mental representation that humans have. So here's this regulatory system that you see in biology being repeated at a higher level of organization uh, in the psychological world. So coming back to our question of whether uh, these regulators over time might have an effect and whether it might represent differences in the quality of mothering or the the patterns of mothering. This was a study that was inspired by Saul Shanberg's work with rats, done by Tiffany Field and others with Saul, in which they took very <clears throat> low birth weight um, human infants and gave them 15 minutes a day, uh, three times a day of uh, massage of the upper trunk and movement, kinesthetic movement of legs. 15 minutes, three times a day. And you can see that there is this extraordinary uh, change in the rate of growth of these premature infants. And I think that uh, one of the practical results of this were that because it also seemed to foster maturation, they were able to discharge the infants four or five days early and it saved $6,000 per infant. They were randomly assigned to these two groups so that uh, we can be sure that that wasn't a factor. And this has been replicated to a certain degree in, uh, by several other people, and I think it really has contributed to the growth of the, uh, the kangaroo care uh, intervention that most neonatal intensive care units have now, where the mother comes in and is given the child in a kangaroo-like pouch. And uh, this experience may work in the same way. And <clears throat> so this is making tactile stimulation keeps coming back again and again. And in the next series of experiments that I want to tell you about, um, it's the licking and grooming that the mothers do with the infants. That's where they get this tactile stimulation. And uh, uh, Michael Meany has really turned a whole new page in the study of long-term effects through his studies using uh, natural variations among rat mothers in the degree of, of licking and grooming that, that they show. And here you can see a high licking and grooming mother licking one of the pups, and there's this arched back nursing, which was one of the other uh, features that, was, uh, that had long-term effects. And this is described in this um, in this subtext here is a lackadaisical mother. Uh, and because this was a um, news article in science, uh, they let themselves go in implications and they suggest that uh, the effects uh, that I'll tell you about in a minute of having a mother like this suited the infants to a easy uh, and uh, 
a nurturing environment, early environment, and the other suited uh, infants to a more hostile environment. And you'll see this sounds uh, absurd at this point, but let me show you what uh, they found. But before I do, since they show, are immediately taking a human application, uh, I think we see some high licking and grooming mothers that have been known since the 16th century at least in this beautiful drawing and uh, a lackadaisical mother by the same, the same painter. This is known as the Madonna of the long neck, but I don't think it's actually a Madonna. It's just a mother, another kind of mother, both perhaps good enough. Okay. So what did he find, Meany and all his uh, uh, colleagues, including Francis Champagne, who's here in the city of Columbia, did a lot of these early studies? Well, the, the offspring of the high licking and grooming dams had lower levels of, of their adrenocortical function. They were not, uh, they were less, they were, uh, had less vigilance, they weren't fearful, and they were not particularly avoidant. They were particularly good at spatial learning. They showed slow sexual maturation and few pregnancies, whereas the offspring of the low licking and grooming dams showed the opposite of all of these. And you can, as you see those, you can sort of see how you get the idea that these are preparations for a different kind of world that are coming in association with these early mother-infant interactions. And because it's animal behavior and you can do experiments, you can do a cross-fostering experiment because if you heard about this in humans, you'd immediately say it's all genetic, the way a lot of people do about the difference between different socioeconomic classes and their parent parenting and their offspring's behavior. But with cross-fostering of, of offspring from a low licking and gram to a high licking and grooming dam, you see the effects of the postnatal mother. Uh, so this is not uh, primarily genetic, although in a minute I'll tell you how the genes are very involved. And then the longest long-term effect, the uh, transgenerational one, is that these uh, offspring, when they become adults, they repeat the same maternal behavior that their mothers did, just the way we think of it being mediated in humans through an internal uh, mental representation. Here, it um, has another mechanism, and it transmits the effects to the next generation. Um, but the mechanism is, is what is exciting everybody, and Tom has already mentioned epigenetics, and these are the effects of the, um, of the packing material, essentially, it was thought to be packing material of the genes, which turns out to have important regulatory action by blocking access of the genetic switches to the molecular signals that turn the genes on and off. So it literally uh, uh, controls gene expression. And <clears throat> one of the ways that epigenetics works is through a simple thing called, well, it's a uh, simple molecule methylation is, is, uh, is methylated is the cytosine, one of the bases. And once methylated, it can't uh, work. Uh, in a way it's not sensitive to its signals. Uh, the avoidance and fear <clears throat> was a result of epigenetic changes in this inhibitory uh, receptor that, and finally we get back to oxytocin and the difference in the licking and grooming has to do with epigenetic changes in the gene for oxytocin that regulate the degree to which it's expressed. So they could measure both the expression of the gene and uh, the presence or absence of these uh, marks, which in the interest of time, I'm going to go through, going to skip trying to explain to you exactly how these epigenetic changes work at the level of the genome and its whole epigenetic uh, control system, which we're learning about. And if you all come back in March, there's a whole session on epigenetics, 101. I forget who's doing it, but one of the professors at Rockefeller, and you can learn a lot more about it. But don't think that this is simply an environmental determinism, which it sounds like at this point. 
It's all in the environment. You change your, if you have your early behavior differences, you're doomed to one or another kind of uh, behavior as an adult. Not at all. The, uh, the effects of the low-licking, grooming mothers can be reversed by simply putting the offspring in an enriched environment uh, with a kind of a rat gymnasium and uh, frequent changes of, of social companions and so on, uh, completely reverses the effect. So these epigenetic marks can come off as well as go on in, due to their interaction with the environment. And also, uh, it shows, uh, some recent studies show how this is, uh, has an evolutionary advantage through what are called predictive maternal effects. Maternal stress during pregnancy for the high-licking and grooming dams converts them to the low-licking and grooming pattern, and they produce offspring that are pre-adapted for adversity now. So it's a way of uh, an anticipatory adaptation rather than the standard Darwinian adaptation, which requires you're actually confronting whatever the selecting uh, pressure is. And this was, uh, just to be sure that this wasn't a prenatal effect of maternal stress, they showed this was true in, in, um, in a second pregnancy where there was no prenatal stress. They continued uh, to show this changed pattern. What do we see in humans that might be like the high licking and grooming other than some 16th century drawings and paintings? If you look at this work that Hilary Fouts has published recently, an anthropologist, the two tribes in Central Africa, and uh, oops, I, I was told to watch out for this, and I said, that'll be no problem. This one's right in the middle. I won't have a problem with it. But, so here we saw, we see that in the tribe that's out uh, in, the, in the forests, uh, foraging and hunting, uh, and have a cooperative and uh, egalitarian tribal organization, there's a great deal of proximity of the infant to the mother in observation by the anthropologists. And they're held by the mother a lot of the time. There's a relatively later weaning age. And um, in the farmer uh, tribe, where in the tribal pattern, of, it was intensely individual with great hierarchy. They all went out by themselves to do the farming. Uh, and the children were hardly held by the mother at all. Weaning age was shorter. And the proximity to the mother was greatly different. Much more of an effect, actually, than in the high licking and grooming mothers. So th this shows that there's tremendous variation that is uh, inherent in the patterning of mother-infant interaction, and that different kinds of patterning work very well in different kinds of social organizations. And finally, uh, I dubbed this the good enough mother. Uh, here, and I think what, what you can see, I sort of think, is this mother has heard what is sometimes told to mothers in intervention projects where they're having trouble with the infant. And one of the things the mother is uh, told by the therapist is, well, there's a simple formula that really seems to work. It says, wait, watch, and wonder. Oh. Here we go. In the case of the uh, two kinds of voles, the ones that were abandoned by their mothers very shortly uh, after weaning, did you experiment leaving those with the, the infants, the pups, with the other kind of voles who would have embraced them and kept them and so on? In other words, was there a cultural or tactile or family impact there? That's a good question. Yes, we, we, we did this, what's called cross-fostering, uh, and I should, clarify that the fact that they, they leave them at two weeks is perfectly fine. This, this is a species that's been around a lot longer than we have. So whatever they do, it works for them. Uh, but if you try the cross-fostering experiment, we thought that perhaps that would really change the behavior, their parental behavior of the offspring when they grew up. 
Uh, not much of an effect on the females, although it did increase paternal behavior, which is basically zero for that species, but it went up very significantly. We thought, oh, this is great. We'll be able to look now at whether the receptors have changed as well, and they weren't. So uh, there, there are probably many ways to become a better dad. Well, thank you. You spoke about the increase in oxyto oxytocin upon birth. Is there any evidence of an increase in oxytocin or other uh, hormones that affect uh, the bonding in an adoption situation? So, so I don't know that there's any evidence for that. The, the, uh, it's a great question. The, uh, what we know about mostly in terms of changes in the hormone level are changes, the studies in animals where we're looking at changes in the brain because that's the part of the system that has to do with behavior. There are lots of things that will move oxytocin in the blood and it's hard to know whether that is actually correlated with changes in the brain. So it's, we're really uh, fairly challenged at this point to understand this system in humans. That's led to these uh, administration studies with the intranasal uh, administration of the peptide, but those are not ideal. What we don't have yet is the chance, for instance, to do neuroimaging, to use PET scans or something like that. Um, there are many people working on that, but it's not yet ready for prime time. Thanks. I actually couldn't hear the earlier question, and maybe I'm repeating it, but I wondered if a woman who has not gone through labor and is not lactating is nevertheless handed a newborn, is there evidence of oxytocin being released in that person? Right, so that's what I was saying, we don't know that. Okay. But, but I think, you know, one of the things I think it's important to remember is that um, relative to voles and rats and mice, we have a three pound computer on top of our hypothalamus that can do an awful lot of work for us. So we have this enormous governor over our hypothalamus that probably tells you that these peptides and hormones that may be really deterministic for rodents are at the most, you know, changing the bias on the system a little bit for us, but there are probably many, many ways for us to change our behavior short of having to use the peptide. Over there. Hi. Um, I was just wondering um, when you said that uh, the effects of separation um, or lack of stimulation of, of an infant can be reversed. When you have children who are institutionalized or who are adopted, say, from you know, other countries, um, occasionally you hear that there's RAD or reactive um, separation disorder. Is that something that can be reversed or when, when does something like that sort of set in? Um, well, I think there are a lot of intervention projects that are trying to, to help with that. There, um, it's, we don't really know very much what's the most helpful way to, um, to help mothers to behave in a way that's better for them and better for the, for the infant. Do you but find there, that, hmm? sorry, with, with children that are, say, put up for adoption that, or maybe, maybe you're not familiar with the studies, that if a child stays with a mother through infant, infancy and then is separated, are they better off or are they better off if they're separated immediately and then reattached? You know, I don't know the, the experiment and I don't know the results, but um, it's, these are, are good questions, as Tom says, <laughs> that we really have to do a lot more uh, research to try to understand. I think that the... Uh... The, most of the science has been, especially recently, has been around the Romanian adoption studies there. So taking children from orphanages where they were really, very much like the monkeys that Myron showed, that were really in a, um, a, a very impoverished environment with very little social stimulation, no evidence of attachment, and then looking at what their long-term outcomes are when they are adopted. There's been a set, set of studies in Britain, a set of studies in the U.S., and the most interesting thing about that is that time matters. So it's when the adoption takes place. And uh, within the first two years, the outcomes are much, much better than thereafter. 
Thank you. We have a question in the back and then one up in the front here. Hi, just a, just a factual question. For the, the last slide that you had for the Kofi tribe in Africa, and I think it was a proxy for high and low licking and grooming with the farming and foraging, I noticed in mortality, and just wonder if I was interpreting it correctly, it looked like there was about a 25% higher mortality rate in the higher licking and grooming versus the lower. Um, and then, you know, with hierarchical and, and non-egalitarian behavior for the lower uh, licking and grooming. And just if any, it just, I find that sort of interesting. So any commentary on that? Yeah, I think that's very interesting. It's the very question that I asked Hillary Fouts about. And the, the answer is he, they can't be sure, but the main factor in mortality in these two tribes is the access to medical care, which is a long slog on a very uh, rudimentary road to where there's any medical attention. And the kinds of factors that, that enter into how, how quickly uh, the child is taken and how good the medical attention it, they get is not something that fits easily into this. And there may be other parts of the culture that make uh, the, the parents who, uh, the, the, the tribe that had the very close relationship may have interfered with their getting the child to medical attention so that it had another aspect of culture that uh, wasn't in our evolutionary uh, package, the availability of modern medical care. Thank you very much. Um, this is a response to a couple of questions about cross-fostering in humans, adoption, and I'll put a plug in for NIH's new uh, seminar series called OpNet. And they just had a terrific one last month and Megan Gunner, have I got that name right? right. Megan Gunner right. at University of Minnesota is doing the studies that several people were asking about. And they have found stress chemistries to be changed. They haven't looked at oxytocin yet. But, um, and they're working with Steve Sumi on that. So anybody that's interested in looking at how, as much as, I, that's probably one of the longest running studies, I think, now. Well, so Chuck Nelson at Harvard is the principal right. investigator. It's a large yeah. effort that we've been supporting for many, many years. And it, yeah. They're looking at these kids who are now in their teens to yeah. sort of find out what the long-term implications are. Right. And that fragile family study is the other incredible one. So those are really interesting ones people might want to know, and they might want to know about OpNet. <laughs> Great. Two questions over here. Um, thank you. Um, I guess for, for understandable reasons, most of what you uh, talked about and reviewed this evening was um, about mother, uh, about mothers. And I guess I'm curious about the um, intensity of father-child uh, attachment, and I guess also the relative importance of it. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, we might uh, take different texts on this. Let me, let me tell you what, what the uh, biologists would say about your question, which is that um, the definition of monogamy, which most of us think has to do with sex behavior, is all about paternal behavior. Monogamous species, and they're about maybe 6% of mammals are monogamous, about 95% of birds. But in every case, what appears to be the most salient detail is um, that they have biparental care. So dads really count in across evolution for um, long-term monogamous social organization. Much more than sexual fidelity, by the way, which is an intriguing aspect of, uh, of evolution. So um, I, I would, so in that case, um, paternal behavior is a, is a huge driver. Um, it's selected for under various conditions. And it has its own biology, which is quite different than um, maternal care, which we don't know as much about. Um, it looks like in the few monogamous species that have been studied that uh, the hormone prolactin, uh, and to some extent vasopressin, which I mentioned is the kind of male analog to oxytocin, may be really critical. But we still don't, <clears throat> excuse me, don't know very much, for instance, about the brain areas uh, that are involved, 
about what is necessary and sufficient for paternal care. Uh, and we don't know much about human paternal care at all, which one would think uh, could be a really rich area for research. Well, and yeah. Um, well, the other aspect of maternal of paternal care is that it can be induced in species where there uh, there really is no paternal care, such as the rat. And you can uh, rat males will can be induced to show maternal behavior. They gather the pups together, they crouch over them, and so on. But it takes days, and they have to be exposed to very young pups, and the pups have to be replaced so they continue to be active day and night. But over a period of time, they can act very maternal. And I can remember some pictures, that, uh, photographs of uh, somebody who was talking about uh, gorillas in a zoo and um, their experiments with the male gorilla that spends absolutely no time with the very young infants. Uh, but if the gorilla was male was introduced very slowly in graded doses over a period of time, um, they showed very touching um, maternal-like paternal behavior. And they had this wonderful picture of this tiny little uh, infant gorilla, and the size disparity is enormous in the gorilla, holding onto the arm as if it was a whole body like this, as the male gorilla moving its arm very gently like this. So uh, for the gorillas in the audience, uh, this, can, this is possible. Give yourself some time. I think that's the sort of thing that, I think that's the sort of thing that happens in grandfathers. I, mean, I think if you ask grandfathers, uh, you'd find a lot more enthusiasm for uh, spending time with small, very small children than you would in the average father, although that may have changed a lot nowadays. Uh, must be much better than, but I was always very organized with my children when I was a father, and I'd set things up, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Now, as a, as a grandfather, I sort of let the child figure, wander in one direction. I sort of follow the child and watch what they're doing, and then I find a way in which I can kind of interact with it, and it's a lot more fun. But then I don't have the responsibility <laughs> for arranging their day. One but there should be a study of grandparents. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, the one thing I've learned in that experience is that it's best to become a grandparent first. <laughs> <laughs> For so many reasons. It, uh, we had a question over here. Uh, does a mother's oxytocin level increase if she is participating in an early intervention parenting program or some sort of therapeutic relationship? A great question. I don't know the answer. Um, but again, you have to remember that it's uh, like a lot of hormones. It, it, it's secreted in surges. And so when you take any point measure, it's a little hard to know what that really means. Um, there is evidence that massage and that uh, certainly any sort of anything that would be a stimulus to lactation will drive oxytocin right through the roof. And those, those are the big stimuli. So, but tactile stimulation in particular of almost any sort does increase it. One last question over here. Oh, we have one with the next, we'll have one more question back there. So here and then back in the back and I think we'll wrap it up. Hi, um, thank you. I just had one question. Have there been any studies done on correlation between oxytocin levels and uh, incidence of prenatal, I mean postnatal depression? Yeah, so, so there's been a lot of interest in um, whether there's a, some association between the levels of peptide and any kinds of psychopathology. And the data aren't really very compelling. Um, there have been, there've been studies that are hard to replicate, and I, so it, and I think it's because it, it bounces around so much, and so the point level it probably isn't that meaningful. Uh, the flip side of this is that people are beginning to use oxytocin to treat all kinds of problems. And right now, there are two big studies going on, uh, not so much with postnatal depression, but with schizophrenia, of all things, trying to increase social engagement in people with schizophrenia, as well as I mentioned with autism. And uh, the results are still very preliminary, but very exciting, very promising. 
The idea of using this for postnatal depression has not really been explored yet, but I believe someone else will have that idea before too long. I just hope we have, after Barry's comment about congressional funding of NIH, I hope we have money left to be able to support it when the idea comes. But uh, certainly, those are the kinds of things that we'd be very interested in. We have the one last question in the back, please. What happens to our Western world where we have a er very early separation from mother to the, from the infant to the mother due to the uh, demands of uh, uh, working society and working mothers? Do we experience an evolution in this species? Do the mothers start, do our species start producing less oxytocin? Uh, does that get transferred to a caregiver or to a school or to a nursery? Um, could, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, could you possibly repeat the question? I didn't the catch the whole difficult question, session. even for me to formulize, <laughs> to formulate, and my English is not that good, but uh, in the, today's world, in our civilized societies, right. mothers have to separate from their infants at a very early stage because of, because of uh, going out to work and handing the infants to caregivers. Mm. And I'm wondering whether that creates um, a process of an evolution to our species in the way the body works. I mean, we produce oxytocin due to uh, pregnancy and then lactation stops and then you have machines. Uh, takes the milk out, and I mean, for me, I'm wondering whether we are going to another step, and whether that we're creating different women in different species. Well, I, I uh, you know, a care day, a caretaker is not the same as a mother, and I'm wondering. I mean, a father would be better. It has more bonding. But I think a nurse, no matter how qualified she is, it's not the same as a mother. Well, so when this goes on and on and spreads, I mean, do we change? Do humans change and produce no oxytocin? Or do we inject well, nurses with oxytocin? I mean. <laughs> well, I, I like that question, but I, and I, I think that what we've learned from the biology of, of uh, parent-infant interaction is that there's enormous variance that's latent in our genetic pool, to say nothing of our uh, cultural uh, adaptations and the kinds of long-term effects that we saw in, in Meany's uh, rat studies. So that I think there's a terrific amount of plasticity that's possible, and I think, yes, we're going to see cultural evolution. We've seen it already. Whether we see biological evolution or not is another question. And uh, it takes, uh, by traditional evolutionary reasoning, it takes many, 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 many generations before you get a uh, change in, in the gene uh, pool in populations. But with, with epigenetic processes, we probably, uh, they can track along with cultural changes. And uh, I think you're right. I think we're seeing changes. And thank goodness, uh, thank nature, that we have the, the innate variability to be able to uh, go along with it and respond to it and succeed in a new way. My, my observation is that we'll find that the grandmothers and the grandfathers are having all of the oxytocin rushes today. Uh, so that's what I would study. At any rate, I want to thank uh, Tom and My Myron for a terrific, really, really fabulous uh, evening and willingness to take on the tough questions. <laughs>